Welcome to part 5 of the video series on Ethics and Professional Practice. Earlier we mentioned that FE civil exam contains a couple of legal topics. Professional liability, contracts and contract law. For any practicing professional, the main causes of liability are going to be from criminal conduct, violation of contract law and liability in tort. The focus of this presentation is going to be on contract law. Before we proceed any further, there is a disclaimer in order. This presentation is meant for engineers as a quick review on contract law and professional liability and it is never meant as a comprehensive coverage of these two topics. Second, the material is compiled from sources that are believed to be authentic. And the third and the most important thing is the presenter, which is me, I am an engineer and I am not a lawyer. Despite my best efforts, information presented here may not be very accurate. So you sh if you must require some legal opinion, consult a qualified attorney and do not take my word for it. We would like to acknowledge and express our sincere gratitude to Mr. Christian Tacit of Tacit Law for allowing us to use some of his material in this video. Let's first talk about contracts and contract law. We all know that contracts are integral part of the engineering practice. There are no separate contract laws or special provisions for the engineering profession. Contract law is general and applicable to engineering practice as well. This presentation therefore covers contract law in general, not specific to engineering practice. First, what is a contract? Contract is an exchange of promises between two or more parties to do or refrain from doing an act which is enforceable in a court of law. Enforceable is the word, keyword here. And it's a binding legal document and the law provides remedies for breaches of contracts. There are six elements to a contract. First, there is an offer and then there is an acceptance. The consideration of the contract an intention to create legal relations and the legal capacity of the people entering into the contract and the legality of the contract itself and then the formalities by which the contract is executed. Let's first talk about offer and acceptance. In order for a contract to be formed, one party must make an offer and the other party must accept the exact same offer. And the evidence on which contract formation is assessed should be objective. Most contracts are written, but some contracts can be oral contracts as well, and they are enforceable. The primary consideration in a contract is the price of the promise, meaning both parties to a contract must bring something to the bargain. The consideration can be either conferring an advantage on another party or incurring some kind of an inconvenience or detriment towards oneself. It is a common law requirement that that consideration be in place in the contract. This consideration must be real but need not be adequate and it must not be from the past. Whenever there is a contract in place, there is this presumption that the parties to the contract intend to be legally bound. Of course, some types of agreements are unenforceable as a matter of public policy. If the contract is in violation of the law, that means it cannot be enforced. Privity of contract. What is privity? Privity is a relation between two parties that is recognized by law. And typically it is only the parties to a contract who can enforce it. For example, on a lease you have the landlord and the renter, or C you will call it, only these two parties can enforce this, uh, enforce the terms of the lease. Here is a tricky consideration. Who can legally enter into a legally binding contract? Those who are contracting must not be under any legal disability. For example, minors or adults who are mentally incapacitated cannot enter into a contract and even if they did, that contract will be void. 
the purpose of any contract cannot be illegal or against any public policy. In order for a contract to be in place, there are certain formalities that need to be followed. As we mentioned earlier, not every contract needs to be in writing. Some can be orally executed as long as there is proof that exists that oral contract is in place. But some contracts cannot be done orally. For example, consideration of marriage, transfer of ownership in land, and somebody is giving surety about debt of another person, so that needs to be in writing, it cannot be orally executed. Of course, various jurisdictions have various laws. It, these things vary by country, and within the country, the provinces, states, or even counties and local municipalities, the laws uh, are going to be different regarding contract law. Intentionally or unintentionally, one party breaches a contract and the other party seeks a legal recourse. Then what? Before determining if there is a breach of contract, first of all, you should ask a few questions. Is there a legal contract in place? Did a breach of that contract occur? Did the breach cause damages to the plaintiff? Were the damages resulting from the breach foreseeable at the time of that contract, at the time that contract was made? Answers to those questions will determine the strength of the case of the plaintiff. If there was no contract, case closed. There was no contract, no breach. If there was a contract and then there was no breach, either no actual breach or a breach occurred but liability is limited by the disclaimer clause, or the time period has expired, or the breach did not result in damages, or damages are foreseeable at the time contract was made. In all these cases, there are solid defenses. When a breach of contract did in fact happen, the primary objective of the law in determining the damage is going to restore the plaintiff to the position he or she would have been if the contract had been performed. Let's talk about the type of damage awards that are to be expected from breach of a contract. There are four types, general, consequential, aggravated, and punitive damages. In all these four cases, plaintiffs have a duty to mitigate their damages. General damages are those compensation for actual losses suffered that are direct result of the breach of contract and they were in contemplation of the parties when the actual contract was formed. Con consequential damages are those compensation for damages that although not naturally flowing from the breach were within the contemplation of the parties when the contract is formed. For example, economic harm. Aggravated da damages awarded for the manner in which the contract was breached causing additional harm. So if a breach if a breach is resulting in emotional distress or mental distress, that is what you call aggravated damage. Punitive damage, on the other hand, is going to be awarded to punish certain types of behavior, fraud, bad faith, etc. There are two clauses in a contract that will determine the damages resulting from a breach. The first is the liquidated damages clause. Liquidated damages is a pre-estimate of loss agreed in a contract if a breach has to happen. The second one is a penalty clause which seeks to deter breaches by requiring the payment of a steep penalty in the event of a breach. And finally, a few tips related to contracts. Before you sign any contract, read it very carefully. Signing a contract, especially in engineering practice, is not necessarily the same as clicking on I agree while you are installing some software on your computer. You have to be more thorough than that while signing a contract. And once you do sign a contract, be faithful to the terms of the contract in both letter and spirit.
Of course, disputes do come across after signing the contract. When they do, sit down with your counterparty and then try to resolve them before going, before seeking any re legal recourse. And if you must seek legal recourse, which is often the case, and you should, of course, seek proper legal help. And that concludes part five of the video series on ethics and professional practice. Thanks for watching.